Eva Marie Nosal is our next speaker. She's an associate professor and department chair at the UH Department of Ocean and Resources Engineering. She holds undergraduate degrees in maths and music, it's important, from the University of Calgary and a master's degree in applied math from UBC, PhD in geophysics from UH. Merging her interests in math, sound, and the ocean, Eva develops tools and methods to monitor the marine environment using passive acoustics. Her talk is entitled, Tricks to Localize Marine Mammals Using Passive Acoustics. Okay, hi there. Um, so I come to you from a bit of a different slant. I'm on the engineering, um, you know, technology development side, as are my colleagues at the Department of Ocean and Resources Engineering. So we have folks who work on underwater vehicles, um, all the technology that goes into the, the tools that you're using. Um, also, colleagues at the College of Engineering work on these tools. So if you're interested in, you know, collaborating with folks um, on that side of things, um, definitely consider us and come to us. Um, we're here to sort of serve uh, the community. So uh, my work is on passive acoustics. Um, I work on, um, I'll just actually introduce this a little bit for those of you who aren't familiar. So for passive acoustics, we use hydrophones to record um, calls uh, made by marine mammals or other uh, animals and process those to uh, learn about uh, occurrence and behavior. We're sort of split into four main categories, detection, which is our animals present, uh, classification, which is what are the species, uh, localization, which is what I specialize in, uh, where are the animals, how are they moving, um, and then density estimation, how many animals, how are they distributed. Uh, benefits of passive acoustic monitoring include that we can uh, monitor continuously at night in rough seas. Um, animals don't need to be at the surface. Um, methods can be automated, and that's where sort of some of my work comes in to try to automate these methods. Uh, we can cover large areas. Um, the disadvantages are that not all animals call all the time. Um, also, analysis methods are still in development, and data can be challenging. We get lots and lots of data, terabytes. Um, so ideally, you want to use multiple methods together. So just jumping right in to the localization work, which is what I work on. Um, there are various techniques. I'll just focus on time difference of arrival methods. And just to set this up, um, here's my animal, <laughs> uh, you know, idealized, right? <laughs> and it's at position W. It emits a call at time T. And that uh, call is recorded on uh, different hydrophones here at position RI and it's recorded at a time ti. And that time of arrival is just the time of emission t plus the travel time, capital ti. Right? So that's my time of arrival. Um, we usually work with time differences of arrival. Um, and there are various reasons for this. It's not always easy to identify exactly when a call arrives versus you can get called uh, differences in time by cross-correlation or other techniques. Uh, Methods can be linearized, assuming a constant sound speed profile. I'll get back to that in a bit. And also, you don't need to solve for the time of, or the time of emission. So in that case, we use delta ti, which is a difference in uh, arrival time, which um, if you just substitute you know, this guy back into here, the, the uh, time of emission cancels out. And you're just left with the time difference in time of arrivals is actually the difference in the travel times. That then, for a pair of hydrophones, defines a parabolic surface. Um, for each uh, difference that you measure, along which an animal can lie, and if you have multiple hydrophones, multiple parabolas intersecting, they'll intersect at the position of the animal. So in classical, sort of the classical approach, Things can be linearized. We assume a constant sound speed profile. Uh, we take multiple hydrophones. I won't get into the details here, but pretty much you come up with a, a linear set of equations. Um, so for this example, we have hi five hydrophones. This is a simple linear equation with four unknowns. 
uh, four equations which can be solved um, to give the animal location. Uh, if we have more than five phones, we have an overdetermined system. We use least mean squares. Fewer dimensions require fewer phones. Okay, problem here is that sound doesn't travel in a straight line. Uh, those assumptions of constant sound speed are often violated, and here's an ideal example, right? Um, the sound, uh, so far channel, right, where sound speed varies with depth here, which leads to refracting rays. So sound will move into uh, sort of prefer areas of lower sound speed, so it'll keep refracting through that channel. Um, so sound propagation effects are important. Um, here's just an example of a, of a real data set where if you don't assume, uh, if you assume a constant sound speed profile, you end up with depths, animal depths that are hundreds of meters, or in this case 100 meters, above where the animal actually is. So in reality, in some cases, it's advantageous to use those sound speed propagation models. The problem is that we no longer have closed form solutions. Uh, we have to use probability density functions and use error analysis based on those. So I'll just introduce sort of the framework uh, really briefly here. Um, just looking at a slice in the ocean from top down, these white dots indicate where the hydrophones are in this case. And we'll, I'll just form a cost function, so ambiguity surface value at each position. So just taking any point in this grid um, it's just going to be, um, you take the measured travel times, which is still these delta tij, and you compare it to what you get from the model. So you model for that given position w, the arrival time that you would get using that sound propagation model for phone i and for phone j. You take the difference between those, that creates your, your model here, and you find the animal position by maximizing this cost function. So this thing, if the model equals the measurement, that will take a value of zero, right? This difference, take e to that, you'll get a, a one. So it's these red lines corresponding to values of one along which the animal is most likely to be. And as you move away from that um, down to these areas of blue, that's where the animal are not likely to be. So for each hydrophone pair, in this case, it's this hydrophone pair giving this hyperbola. Uh, this hydrophone pair will give that hyperbola. This hydrophone pair gives that. We stack those surfaces on top of each other, multiply them uh, using this multiplier here over all hydrophone pairs. And that gives the resolution here of the actual animal location. So this works really nicely. We can incorporate sound speed profiles. Um, it works great if you have a single animal calling, <laughs> um, which unfortunately is not often the case. So the nice thing about this is it actually sets a framework for which we can deal with more complicated problems. Um, and that's what I've been sort of focusing my, my efforts on most recently. So I'll just give you briefly two difficult cases where um, this approach has been successfully applied. The first is where you have multiple animals, but you can't associate the calls over the hydrophone pairs, meaning you don't know, this is for stereotypical calls, um, so you don't know on which hydrophone how they're associated with each other. Um, so the motivating data set here comes from the Bahamas, the tongue of the ocean, uh, Autec range, oh, and pointer died. Okay, anyway. Uh, Autec range here is, is that deep tongue of the ocean right next to the Bahamas. Uh, the Navy has a highly instrumented um, bottom-mounted hydrophone range. Uh, there's uh, data sets available um, from the workshop on detection localization, uh, density estimation of marine mammals using passive acoustics, more on that later. Um, but that uh, data set is available. This range covers 10 by 10 kilometers or so. Um, five hydrophones, multiple sperm whales in this case, clicking, and you can't pull apart what those clicks are, you know, how, how to associate them. So to deal with this, first you establish the time differences of arrival. Um, and to do this, I sort of went through, got all the clicks on all the hydrophones and made all possible associations. You come up with this kind of really messy looking scatter plot. Uh, with time on the x-axis and time difference arrival on the y-axis. Thanks. <laughs> and, 
And uh, if you were to zoom in, I'm just going to zoom in on that red box on the top, and you can actually start to see the, the consistent, persistent clicks that are associated with a single animal moving through the range. The rest are misassociated clicks, so clicks getting associated with the wrong one on another hydrophone pair. So one of the keys is to track these um, you know, persistent tracks through here. Once we pull those out, uh, you do that for all of the scatter plot, and you can pull out multiple time differences of arrival tracks. Now, this framework sets the stage. Um, instead of just taking the single time difference of arrival, now we, for each hydrophone pair, we have multiple uh, possible time differences of arrival. So what I can do now is instead of just taking one, I'm going to take the maximum for that given point, the one, the time difference arrival that maximizes the surface at that point. So in this case example, this is my hydrophone pair. I have two different hydrophone or two different possible time differences arrival, uh, resulting in two hyperbolas here. And for another hydrophone pair, I get a different two. Uh, stack these, multiply them together, and I get four possible locations. If I then stack all of the different hydrophone pairs together, the actual animal location falls out. In fact, here there's one, two, maybe three animals present. Um, so video a little scattered. You can see the, the animals moving through the system one, two, three, and there's actually a fourth one in here by then doing some tracking through those uh, maxima positions, we end up with those uh, tracks. This is showing in two dimensions. We're actually tracking in three dimensions. Um, these are the resulting tracks. We don't have um, ground truth data, right? So um, this is one of the limitations. Uh, but we have reasonable tracks. Um, refined tracks uh, are, are pretty well represented. And if I look at depth, time, Depth as a function of time, those are also realistic profiles. Looking at the inner click intervals and so on, um, I'm pretty uh, confident that the tracks I'm pulling out are reasonable. Um, and just really quickly, because I'm out of time, this is another difficult case. So if we have multiple animals, we can associate between pairs. But unfortunately, in a lot of bioacoustic studies, uh, Timing is an issue. So on these big Navy ranges, you know, they're all cabled to shore. The hydrophones are well synchronized in time. But in bioacoustic studies, often you're working with autonomous hydrophones that don't have timing um, associated between them. That is really a problem for, for localization methods. So one data set coming from uh, the Big Island in Kailua Kona, uh, just ears that are autonomous um, with 90 meter spacing between them. Uh, we put in synchronization pings there every 30 minutes uh, and got results that look like this. So these are dolphin whistles recorded on those ears. You get maxima in the ambiguity surfaces, but some of the surfaces had no maxima or maxima that were occurring outside of the water column. So in this case, you know, the, the dolphins are definitely not above the surface, so something's going on. If I look at the ambiguity surface values as a function of time since the synchronization ping, I see something sort of uh, fishy going on, which is that those values are decreasing as I get away from my synchronization ping. That indicates that the timing, uh, the clocks have drifted relative to each other. So here we go. We, we sort of modify this uh, framework, right, to include time differences, those clock drifts in our model. So now I include uh, phone time offsets in my model. Uh, in this case, I need to localize multiple animals at the same time, otherwise my problem is unconstrained. Um, so I rely on multiple animals, one, two, three, um, and then find the, the, the clock timing offset and the position, all the positions that uh, maximize my ambiguity surface. In a simulation with four sources, the blue are the correct sources, red are estimated locations. I'm solving also for clock offset. I do quite well. As you increase the number of sources, so you become more informative, uh, the results improve. And so indeed, when I apply this to the real data um, and look at the resulting ambiguity values, they've all improved. And that case where the animal was above the surface now gives me more realistic animal locations. 
And with that, um, I'd like to thank Dave Moretti and the team at Newick for providing Autech data, Mark Lammers for ear data, funding from ONR, and Bell Hop was provided, which is the ray tracer by Mike Porter. And if you're all interested in this work, please, um, this is just a plug for the detection, classification, localization uh, workshop, which will be held in on the Big Island next December. So look at this website, go there, and uh, you can hear all more about this work. Thank you. Questions for Eva? Scott? <laughs> so calibration could be improved by putting a D-tag with some sort of pinger uh, on the, one of the sperm whales tracking on the object? That would be wonderful, yeah. I mean, getting ground truth data would be fabulous. Um, so if there's any way <laughs> to, yeah, have some tags. Sorry, that's my timer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm open to, you know, getting that sort of um, background calibration data. Or flying a glider with known position, um, sending out pings, which has obviously its own associated um, issues with it, but. Okay, thanks again. <laughs>